Good morning. We're continuing to look at the presentation on parting from the four clingings. The four clingings are the clinging to, to this one life, the clinging to the three realms or samsara in its entirety, the clinging to our own self-importance, our own self-interest, and the clinging to, our, um, to, to true existence. So these are the four clings that we need to be uh, separated from, we need to separate ourselves from. And the motivation that, that we need to generate in, in order to make this a training of the, the Mahayana is to remind ourselves that there is no great difference between ourselves and others. We all desire happiness and freedom from suffering. But until one is separated oneself from these four clings, a state of lasting happiness, a state of lasting peace, freedom from suffering cannot be attained. Therefore, it's imperative that we strive to, 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 to attain freedom from these clings in order to be able to actualize Buddhahood and thereby be able to guide others skillfully for, to the attainment of the same state. The last night then we came to look at the, the fourth of these, which is that, that of um, uh, abandoning uh, 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 true grasping. And we looked at how that this is imperative in order to attain enlightenment. So last night we started on looking at the fourth of the four clingings. え、シビオモペネテシエリプシアデラネミュリプシアニゴレニュリプタシエリプニゴパパラアネトンギトベシェラタマゴンバイナペネチャンジュセムチャンニジコムチャンジュセムガゼコンバイナチャンジュセムギ
minds of love and compassion and bodhicitta, as well as the, the trainings in, of, of ethics and generosity and patience, just perseverance and concentration are within the mind of a bodhisattva. Without the wisdom realizing emptiness, enlightenment cannot be achieved. So therefore, the, the bodhisattva, striving for enlightenment for the sake of others, strives to develop conabiding in um, a mind of uh, special insight or meditative insight, bringing these two in a union. And with this union of calm abiding and meditative insight, they realize emptiness. And here then, with a, uh, the union of uh, the, uh, the, the, with a, with a direct realization of emptiness, supported by the mind of bodhicitta, with both of these minds, enlightenment is definite. So therefore, in order to achieve Buddhahood, one has to cultivate bodhicitta as well as the wisdom realizing emptiness, and that to have the sufficient strength of this realization needs to come about in dependence on the union of calm abiding and meditative insight. <laughs> what I'm saying here is, is, I'm saying in a light-hearted way, but there really is some truth to it. So when you look at these um, worldly situations from the perspective of the Mahayana, then when we are in a, a situation where we're uncomfortable, if we utilize the techniques of mind training, we can transform our own discomfort into, into a, an opportunity to accumulate merit to, and to be of benefit to others. So when one is a little bit cold, but if one can develop compassion for the suffering of others, as well as love with a, from a feeling of closeness and appreciation for others, then one accumulates very strong beneficial minds. And likewise with the converse situation. So look at in these situations, so in such, with, through such techniques, we can use uh, these very mundane uh, situations to develop closer and harmonious relationships with others, keep our mind calm and open and spacious, as well as accumulate virtue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jambalasuba <laughs> Simjatamjigunasela, Tomayi the practitioners aspiring for the parts of, of the bodhisattvas, aspiring to become a Buddha for the sake of others, generates love and compassion. But doing so also in conjunction with the cultivation of the wisdom realizing emptiness, knowing that these minds are all imperative for the achievement of Buddhahood. Giving rise to, having given rise to the mind of bodhicitta, where they've taken on as their personal commitment 
to strive to become a Buddha, the most skilled of guides, in order to be of benefit to others, they then will make concerted effort in the cultivation of the wisdom realizing emptiness, knowing that for beings to be freed from suffering, emptiness has to be realized. The wisdom realizing emptiness has to be cultivated. This is the only way to eliminate the afflicted minds, all our suffering. And the Bodhisattva, whilst solely focused on the welfare of others and having overcome their own self-interest, they will strive to realize emptiness so that they can guide others in their cultivation of the wisdom realizing emptiness based on their own experience. So, wanting, so knowing that to be able to guide others skillfully, it is insufficient just to have mere knowledge. But that knowledge needs to be transformed into experiential realization. The Bodhisattva strives to realize emptiness in order to guide others to achieve the same realization. Mm-hmm. The brief what we looked at last night in this context was that um, the, 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 the fourth uh, cling, cling to be parted from, if grasping arises, it is not the view. Term, this um, term here, grasping, refers to grasping at inherent existence, grasping at true existence. And this um, phenomena appear to us as being inherently existent then um, a mind uh, grasps at the at phenomena as existing in this way. This is the mind of true grasping, and this is what has to be abandoned. And without this being abandoned, enlightenment is not possible. The only way to abandon it, this, uh, this ignorance of true grasping, is to cultivate the direct antidote, which is the wisdom realizing emptiness. So that, in brief, we looked at last night. Mm. Na now, returning to the text, we starting with the th- um, third line in verse 25. To explain this as well in greater detail, there is no liberation for those who grasp at existence, there is no high rebirth for those who grasp at non-existence. And those who grasp at both are ignorant, so place your mind freely in the non-dual sphere. Last night we looked at this topic, but in a, in a very condensed way. So we just looked at the preceding two lines. Now the um, author, he presents the, the, this topic in a more detailed way. Mm. Chet <laughs> Jangan 
Look at the first line in the 26th verse, there is no liberation for those who grasp at existence. Here, we, uh, there's reference being made to, to this mind of grasping. So this mind of grasping can be seen in two ways, one as being acquired and one as being um, innate. And here this is referring to um, the acquired grasping, so one that comes about due to uh, uh, philosophical views. Chetamjan the non person giga philosophical schools. So they uh, uh, so the, now this explanation is from the perspective of the Prasangika. So the non-Prasangika schools, they grasp at phenomena as existing inherently. And therefore they have this acquired grasping because it comes from their philosophical view. It's not, whereas the Prasangikas, they certainly also grasp at phenomena, but this is an innate grasping. It's a, 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 or a, a Maybe you could say a natural grasping. It's not a grasping that has been produced in dependence on a philo philosophical view. As long as one has this um, acquired grasping, it is not possible to realize emptiness. Therefore, it's not possible to attain Buddhahood. So therefore, it's imperative for grasping to be abandoned. Mm -hmm. Zimbabwean as we repeat that then, as long as one has the acquired grasping at inherent existence, one cannot realize emptiness. If one cannot realize emptiness, one cannot eliminate the afflictions. If one cannot abandon the afflictions, one cannot attain liberation from samsara and one cannot attain Buddhahood. So therefore, Acquired, the acquired grasping at inherent existence is a great obstacle to be abandoned. Uh, Innate grasping, though, this too needs to be abandoned. Because as long as one innately grasps 
at phenomena as in, in, um, existing inherently, one still is going to be influenced by the afflictions, and one cannot attain liberation or enlightenment. So this too needs to be um, uh, uh, eliminated. So here the practitioner will meditate on emptiness, meditate on emptiness, repeatedly um, developing the realization of, 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 of emptiness, the cultivating the wisdom, realizing emptiness, in order to abandon this innate grasping at inherent existence. And here the Kassan Shevan and Chibari, 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 Lolopa,六下巴,马英巴,让我有巴,金国,六下巴,马英巴,让我有巴,但是,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃,呃
这是一个人的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家庭的家
那三句国王出来的，哎，你八下十三八菜完成，那点么都不拿来给鱼，金鱼还好买的，但是没买的，拿拿来给买的，买完了，但三句一拉，哎，你点么都不拿完事的，那变成羊毛把八下的，再把八
course, it doesn't mean we don't have true grasping. We certainly do. But the true grasping we have hasn't come about through um, analysis and reason and the adopting of a philosophical view. Our true grasping is innate. So we too have it. But this is innate, it naturally arises within us. It hasn't been acquired through the adoption of a tenet. ทาวทุกุริเบลัมนะทันกิยอบะยินะยาทันกิเดมาปะบะยินะทาวทุกุมาเรสทันกิเดปังกุโกเรสซะดินราชินจุบะจิมิจิมบะทันกิเดทันก
yet still have true grasping. But this is the innate true grasping. Sangi and and ดีเจเนอันนี้ดีบัจจัยอาสาวมาตัวเกวาสาเฮลกะเลโหรุงบาร์วะจิซาเดเนซาอินทิบาสาบานังงาซอยกิกมาตัวอันนั้นฮาด
and therefore come to this wrong view that phenomena do not exist. So this isn't something uh, absurd and, 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 and almost impossible to imagine, in that we've heard presentations on how phenomena appear to the mind, and then we encourage to invest, investigate to see whether they exist in this way or not. And if one does ex in investigate well, one will come to the conclusion that phenomena do not exist in the way that they appear. One will not be able to find any trace of any phenomenon. And at that point, there is the danger. There is the danger that one can come to the conclusion that phenomena do not exist. And if phenomena do not exist, virtue doesn't exist, non-virtue doesn't exist. Results of happiness, results of suffering do not exist. So there is a real danger that one can come to a, a wrong view through engaging in analysis. Rang and and these, these wrong views of uh, uh, um, the view of eternalism or the view of nihilism, these are quite easy to develop in the sense that if one studies, for example, if one studies a, a receives teachings and studies and accepts a tenant, that a philosophical view that phenomena do exist by way of their own nature, then one has developed the uh, acquired grasping as inherent existence, so the, and thereby developed the the the, uh, the view of of eternalism. So this is it's very easy to come to the many uh, view, uh, philosophical views that present this. Likewise. If one in investigates reality and comes, comes to the conclusion that as no inherent nature can be found within phenomena, phenomena do not exist. And thereby one comes to the view of nihilism that phenomena do not exist at all. And this too is something that, one ca uh, that uh, uh, can easily be adopted. <coughs> <coughs> Uh,ダタダン、チェタカヤマネボ、ニグオマダタダネバマレチェタネバヨマレ。ガスネ。ああ、ジュギュラ、ラシンチュバチミチンボクンダヨマレ、エンザンアザダタダマネバレ。ジ
但我觉得我们的人生活在这里我们的人生活在这里我们的人生活在这里我们的人生活在这里我们的人生活在这里我们的人生活在这里我们的人生活在这里我们的人生活在这里我们的人生活在这里我们的人生活在这里我们的人生
Look at our third line. And those who grasp, grasp at both are ignorant. And those who grasp at both are ignorant. Or more literally, those who grasp at both um, lack knowledge or do not know. So this, this refers then to those who uh, grasp at, at true existence and, and through a, a, a tenant believe that phenomena exist by way of their own nature and thereby have this view of eternalism. For them, it's not possible to develop the wisdom realizing emptiness because they are ignorant or they, they lack uh, uh, knowledge. Likewise, those who have, uh, accept the view of nihilism, who believe that phenomena, if they, as they don't exist inherently, they do not exist at all, they certainly cannot realize emptiness. So they too are ignorant and they too uh, lack the p- uh, potential to realize um, emptiness. Mm Semmatu the fourth line then encourages us to place your mind freely in the non-dual sphere. So this refers to then, one investigates firstly how phenomena appear and then to see do they exist in the way they appear. One investigates and comes to see they do not exist in the way that they appear. One continues one's investigation seeing though that this does not mean that phenomena do not exist at all. It does not mean phenomena are non-existent. And thereby, one places one's mind in accordance with the middle way view in between these two extremes of eternalism and nihilism. And this is what's referred to in the fourth line, to place your mind freely in the non-dual sphere. children. <coughs> We come to the next verse. All things are but objects of the mind, without searching for a creator of the four elements, such as a wise diviner, Isvara, and so on, place the mind freely in the sphere of mind itself. Mm-hmm. A further commentary to, to this text. So in this um, mind training book, there's several commentaries to parting from the four kings, and our is reading from another one. Um, establishing the appearances of objects as mental constructs. Mm. Three points here. So this is the first, establishing the appearances of objects as mental constructs. Establishing perceptions as illusions. Establishing illusions as devoid of intrinsic existence. So I'll repeat them again. Establishing the appearances of objects as mental constructs. Establishing perceptions as illusions. Establishing illusions as devoid of intrinsic existence. Uh, 
Simi I'll read this here again and then come to Gendler's commentary. Establishing the appearances of objects as mental constructs. Establishing, so this is what he's talking about, about in a moment. Establishing perceptions as illusions and establishing illus illusions as devoid of intrinsic existence. So whatever ap appears to us, for example, form that appears to our eye consciousnesses, um, uh, uh, smells that appear to our nose consciousness, uh, tastes that appear to our, our, our um, tongue consciousness, and uh, objects of touch that appear to our body con consciousness, whatever appears to us is dependent on causes and conditions. There's nothing that appears to our minds, our consciousnesses, that are not dependent on causes and conditions. Moreover, and, and, and yes, yeah, so there's nothing that appears to our consciousnesses that are not dependent on causes and conditions. And moreover, it's also due, due independent on the imprint or, or a synonym would be potencies on our continuum that these objects appear to our mind. <coughs> All phenomena that appear to our mind do so dependently, and included in this process of dependence, or the, the, the variety of dependence, there is the inference on our continuum. So therefore, that phenomena appear to our mind dependent on mind itself. Mm. Mm. The commentary that was just given then relates to the first line, all things are but objects of the mind. Now, in English, the third line, such as the wise diviner, Isvara, and so forth. Uh, a wise diviner then could be someone, for example, who um, um, does divinations. So, yeah, now we can't come to commentary on the third line. I want you, last of us, I want you, I want you, I want you, I want you, Sweshanangolia, 
this um, third line, such as the wise, the pioneer, the and so on. This then serves to, to stand against the doubt that phenomena do not appear to our mind independence on causes and conditions, including imprints on, on, on the continuum, but rather that all appearances come about independently, but through um, perhaps the Buddha, or through a wise diviner, or through Ishvara, or a creator god. So this is not accepted. so of these three points that Gen is referring to, now he comments on the second, establishing perceptions as illusions. So here the meditator reflects that whatever appears to our mind are like illusions. So if we think of an illusion that we have observed, so the, um, the traditional presentation would be the mag magician conjures an elephant or a horse, but whatever illusions that we've uh, um, observed, they do not exist in the way that they appear. So it's th with that analogy, we say that whatever appears to our mind are like illusions. They do not exist in the way that they appear. Just like when we've seen a magic show, we know that what appears to us that is an illusion. It doesn't exist in the way that it appears. But that doesn't apply only to the world of magic, but to whatever appears to our mind. Now, <laughs> and now for our south second line, without searching for a creator of the four elements. This then just presents a further way that the phenomena are not created by. The, so the, um, here then the meaning that, that we're coming to is that phenomena do not exist in the way they appear, just like an illusion doesn't exist in the way that it appears. However, this doesn't mean that phenomena do not exist at all. They still, they do exist, but only conventionally. They do not exist ultimately. And the way we normally express this is that phenomena do not exist in the way that they appear, which is truly or inherently. Rather, they come about independence on causes and conditions and imputation. 
So therefore, phenomena do not exist ultimately, but they ex conventionally, they exist. Mm. Uh, uh, ガンザムチリアね、ガンラエナワナシンザワギネメバトンサンシトンロアディ、トンイセミテンドチネセム、セムレ、セムキトウセセムナワナシセムデカネシトチェバチデ、セムデランゴゴ、ガンヤバトン
One just abides in the realization that one has come to. And one holds this realization single-pointedly. So I'll read the, um, the, the quote from the commentary again. You don't dwell on the past, anticipate the future, or construct the present. And relinquishing distractions to the objects, you observe the mind's own nature and place your attention upon it single-pointedly. ตัวนี้เลยมีไปชิลาสุนเดชกงโกเวนซาดีกว่าสุตัวนี้เลยมีไปชิเนดูฟ้าตาตัวนี้ดีนี่ดีชิกินสารวัตรสุนเวนซา
这是东西都不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能去不能
Rashin Jimbada if you look at this thing from the perspective of the Mahayana, if one thoroughly trains in the cultivation of bodhicitta, as well as and, and, and even giving rise to bodhicitta, and but engages just in the first five perfections. Whilst there's tremendous benefit from this, so much virtue is, is accumulated. As the wisdom realizing emptiness is lacking, the afflictions cannot be eliminated. Conversely, if someone shies away from the, the cultivation of love and compassion to the to the strength where bodhicitta arises and focuses solely on the wisdom realizing emptiness, they are not creating the causes that will lead to Buddhahood because they lack the mind of bodhicitta. So here one is encouraged to train in both, cultivating both the wisdom realizing emptiness and bodhicitta. When these two are cultivated, then when one engages in the trainings of the six perfections, they have so much power. We've heard many times that how much virtue a, a, an activity accumulates depends on the power of the motivating mind. If the, the virtuous activity is motivated by bodhicitta, vast doors of virtue are accumulated. If it's motivated by the, the sincere wish to achieve liberation from stuff, suffering, still vast doors of merit are accumulated. And even if one is truly motivated to achieve a good rebirth, lots of merit is accumulated. The amount of merit that is accumulated from the same act depends on the strength of the motivating mind. And if the motivating mind has both the union of bodhicitta, has the union of bodhicitta and, and the wisdom realizing emptiness, vast doors of merit are accumulated. And that, that activity becomes the cause that leads to enlightenment. So here again, to encourage one, remind oneself that if one only trains in, in bodhicitta, one will become a bodhisattva. Achieve the a path of accumulation, but one will not be able to progress past the very first level, the small level of the path of accumulation. And the path of accumulation is the first of the five paths. Similarly, though, if one only tra uh, trains in the wisdom realizing emptiness, one will not even give rise to the bodhisattva path of accumulation. So, therefore, one needs both the wisdom realizing emptiness as well as bodhicitta. Mm. <coughs> What 
Tantuye Jamiju The definite sequence of trainings that all aspirants for, for the to, all aspirants who, for, uh, who wish to cultivate a path within their continuums is that the need to engage in, in the trainings that are shared with the being of, of initial capacity, reflecting on the preciousness of this opportunity that we've achieved, its rarity and its great meaning, having given rise to an understanding of the importance of this life, reflect on the impermanence of it. This serves to, to, to help uh, change our focus, ch change our priorities. We heard about this in, at the beginning of the presentation of, of this text, when you're looking at the abandonment of the, the, the first clings. And here, the, then, and thereby giving a, a change in focus, the mind gets a, a greater strength. And to add to this strength, one reflects at the possibility, the possible rebirths that await one. And at the time of death, one only can fall to the low realms or remain in the upper migrations. And seeing the sufferings in the low realms, based on the strength of mind one has already cultivated, here the practitioner has, 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 has a strong focus to strive for, for a good rebirth. The mind is no longer overcome by worldly happiness and suffering. Taking that meditation further, they see that actually, just being freed of the potential for a lower realm rebirth in my next life, whilst essential, is really a small attainment. Because wherever I remain in samsara, my experience pervades, is pervaded by suffering. And here, the meditator reflects on the suffering nature of samsara through reflecting on the, three suf uh, the presentation of the three sufferings, those of mental and physical pain, those of transient pleasure, and all pervasive suffering giving rise to this wish to definitely emerge from suffering. And these are the trainings shared with the being of intermediate capacity. And these are essential to training as well, because they give ever greater strength of mind, ever greater purpose to the pract practitioner, and makes their mind ever vaster and their outlook more far-sighted. And this strength of mind is required to engage in these, these uh, uh, trainings with sincerity and to actually be able to progress rapidly in these trainings. Then one progresses further, reflecting, taking this realization that one has come to, and applying it to others, seeing that all beings are suffering in the same way due to the same reasons. And here one takes this understanding and develops uh, and develops it through reflecting on, on, on our relationship with others, the kindness they've shown us, and, and so forth, giving rise to the altruistic attitude of universal responsibility, where we see that others remaining in the state of suffering is unacceptable. Their liberation is imperative. This is my personal responsibility. And having generated that one is then ready to cultivate the mind, or generate the mind of bodhicitta. And this is the training that is unique to the being of supreme capacity. 
And where in these trainings is so uh, an aspirant who has the wish to become a bodhisattva, an aspirant who wants to enter the path of a bodhisattva, where here should they meditate on emptiness? Maybe different presentations, but my, my recommendation is that when one comes to the meditation that, on, uh, that is unique to the being of supreme capacity, when one has generated compassion for all beings, that is the point. When compassion is generated, to meditate on emptiness. This is before the generation of bodhicitta, but after the generation of compassion. And why is it recommended here to meditate on emptiness? Because when compassion for suffering has arisen, then one reflects on what is the cause of suffering. Because compassion is the wish for beings to be freed from suffering and its causes. What are the causes of suffering? The afflicted minds that lead to the cultivation of contaminated karma. And what are the causes of the afflicted minds? All the afflicted minds arise in dependence on the ignorance of self-grasping. And here, one then meditates on the emptiness of, the, of, of true existence, the emptiness of inherent existence. When one here comes to realize emptiness, then one sees that the cause of all suffering can be eliminated. Liberation and enlightenment is possible. My aspiration for all beings to be freed of suffering is realistic. It can be achieved. And I know this with certainty due to the power of my meditation on emptiness. With that knowledge, that strength of mind, then it becomes much easier to generate the, um, the mind of, of altruism where one takes responsibility for the welfare of others and thereby in dependence on that commits to striving to become a Buddha for the sake of others. So this is a definite sequence to engage in. And those practitioners who have trained in this sequence and have given rise to actual love and compassion, for such practitioners, then there is no longer a need to continue to train in the practices that are shared with a being of initial capacity. But until that ha has happened, one needs to engage in all of these trainings so as to keep developing one's strength of mind, one's focus, and thereby be able to progress and, and, and develop these, these, these paths within oneself. And we will uh, conclude here for this morning. Um, if you have some questions, then please Please feel free to ask. Alan. Um, Christian was talking about the object of negation by reasoning, uh, which is the appearance of inherent existence. It's a non-existent. Uh, I've heard some people say that that appearance, as being a mere appearance, is an existent. So appearance is an existent, but the that quality of the appearance being you know, existence okay. is non-existent. Okay. So it's part of this existent and non-existent. The appearance existent and then the non-existent quality, which is the inherent existence. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask the question slightly differently because hopefully I didn't say that. Because that is what I said last night. Um, so hopefully I didn't say it again this morning. So I'm, I'll just ask it very generally. Can I, can I repeat what the object of negation by reasoning is? And when he repeats that, I'll ask him to talk about then um, the, about the appearance of inherent existence, and is that an object of negation? Yeah. Okay. Then again, ripe ripe gaksha. They call it yankya sonorna. Then it dead sarne. Kerang di di dunti. Di tempo dopo nangwa. They call it sonorna. Kalinsa kung tarung ko tomsa. Is <laughs> Now, 
那我是中国人,那我是日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本人,日本
of, of true existence. This is a permanent phenomenon, and it is not the um, uh, observation to omniscience. So the observation to omniscience is in, an impermanent phenomenon. The, um, the, the immediate generality, and, and, and the observation to omniscience is an impermanent phenomenon. It is a non-associated compositional factor, and it is the appearance of true existence. The, um, the, the uh, uh, meaning generality of true existence is a permanent phenomenon and is not the obscuration to omniscience. What Gendler then said earlier in Alan's answer, and I didn't say, was that to us, the appearance of the, the mental image of, of true existence and true existence itself appears mixed. They are in, to us, they are inseparable, indistinguishable. To us, it's not that they are indistinguishable, but to us they are. So he said that again now, I think, but he definitely said that earlier too. Okay. Okay. Steve at the back. Um, if in previous lives we have acquired the, um, the true grasping interdependence, mm -hmm. which is a subtle mental consciousness, mm -hmm. is this carried forward? Mm -hmm. So if in a, in a previous life we um, accepted a philosophical tenet that asserted true existence and therefore we had acquired true grasping, um, is that the carried forward to our current life? It's a subtle mental consciousness. A, a subtle mental consciousness. Then it, now so, thank you for hope, we will have the imprint the imprints the potencies propensities of that view but we won't have that view. So does that become an innate? Is that then innate instead of acquired? Okay. So is is so what was an acquired view in the past, a past life, does it become an innate view in this life? An in innate true grasping. An innate true grasping. Then a kyo mama ki um kuntak uh um ကွန်တက်တန်လင်ကီလင်ကီတင်ဆင်ကျူကြီးတယ်ပဲအဲဒင်ဇီဒင်ဇီကျူရှင်ဆင်တာအဲခေါ်တော့ကျူတို့ပ
So earlier when Gina was talking about the cultivation of the union of calm abiding and meditative insight on the object of emptiness, he presented this according to his own knowledge and experience, but mentioned that the other traditions would present this differently. Um, do they all come to the same conclusion yeah, though? I, I thought, I thought Gina said yeah, yeah. they do come to the same conclusion. Mm. Um, so what is that conclusion? Okay. Then we can Shinak Sundro Ode, Selsinangdu, De Tsane Kerengi, the Nye Samsuyin, Yene Sama Chuluk Shempeki Lama, Konso Sungtang Tang Loka Yore, then a canon so Tsama, Kerang and Konso Tsama, the Gyuri the Amalam, the Tablam, Loka Lap Yore, you need the Jebu, they don't cheap at a bear. Jevo was Jibai Tablam Chidan Zavigi Lam Yam Nesita Chibichi Kavakayama in a sick page of Tata Daya, just to assess me, come down to the desk, Kavakasan, so so rangi, the day, eh, Gomnas, Jimidi, Gomnachi, whatever, Marasan, Midi, so so nano, so we get Salon, Tata, Lunda, Kavatos, which is a teacher. ก็ทางเจ้าเลยเดี๋ยวสุขเข้าไปกูรู้ว่าที่ใจมันจะเจอไปกี่ลําตรงทางยังไม่ได้ที่บอกเข้าไปกินอะไรก็เออเดี๋